Hello, hello, welcome back. And today we're doing a book review on this amazing book, Nine Figure Mindset, How to Go from Zero to Over $100 million in Your Net Worth. And it's by Brandon Dawson, who works for Grant Cardone, who's like the top sales guy in the entire world. And the foreword is by John C. Maxwell, who is one of the top thinkers of our time. So it's a really good book. So here I'll just go over the main points of the book so you kind of know what it's about and so you can read it too. So the first thing he said was, your dreams are not only possible, but they should be your priority. And by the way, they might not be big enough. I thought that was a good way to start the book. So I'm gonna be kind of like looking down and reading my notes. So this will be more of a talking style video, just so you know. So first is the question, whom do you listen to? Your mentor or your family and friends? I mean, are you going to listen to someone who hasn't actually done what you're trying to do, which is your family and friends usually, because this makes their advice mostly worthless. It's kind of like asking a super overweight person how to get skinny. Like, obviously they don't know or they would have done it, right? Um, so he said the fastest way to succeed is to find the closest example of what you want to accomplish and model yourself after the person who has achieved it. So whatever you're thinking, put in your name, whatever you're thinking, Amanda, 10x that. You know, that's what Cardone tells us. So think this all the time. Whatever you're thinking, 10x it. Another point he said was no more complaining or speaking negatively about the past. Because what you think, you say. And then you do. And that creates your legacy. You know, bury the past. You know, after you alchemize it, I mean, learn the lessons, extract the gold from your past and then bury it and now create your future. Don't spend time in the past. You can't change it. You can just take what you learn from it and that's gonna help propel you forward. And since my brother and I were kind of like in sales, I kind of took some notes of um, some cold calls that he would do. So you can skip over this little part if you want. But um, he would say, hey, Brandon here. And I'd say, I'm calling from Starkey. Hey, Don, what is your inventory looking like? Do you need more hearing aids? And he'd say whatever they would say, whether yes or no, he would get into the habit of asking follow-up questions. He said he might ask if they had any hearing aids on their shelf. And if they'd say no, well then how many they'd sold the previous week? If they said four, then he'd ask them, what would happen if they stocked 10 devices rather than the usual four? Do you think you can, um, do you think you could sell them, he'd ask? And they'd usually say yes. And so if they would express concern of like an of excess inventory, he'd remind them of Starkey's 30 day return policy for unused or defective devices, a policy that most of the sales reps forgot to talk about so, or didn't put them, you know? And so he'd remind them of Starkey's 30 day return policy and you know, that little bit would make him sell more a day than others would in a, like a whole week. Just this little thing. So that's why I kind of um, wrote down his little sales script because a lot of people, like even when you go to a store, like the mall, and they ask, do you need help looking for anything? And of course you usually say no because you don't want someone like tagging around who you don't even know. But they should like be more talkative and kind of like try to see what you want. So instead of expecting you to just come up with everything to say. And that's exactly what he does. And that's how he would sell more in a day than most sales reps in a week. So that's really powerful. So he says, there's also no point doing anything after you master it. After you master something, your next step is teaching others how to do it and then teaching them to teach others because there's no leverage in doing anything on a one-to-one -one ratio. And people, employ, you know, employees, they need to know exactly what you expect of them why what they're doing is important or matters and how it fits in the big picture and especially what is in it for them because we all want to know what's in it for us so he said when so i'm speaking of his words when i opened my next company i followed this line of thinking with the first person i hired when we first started doing cold calling for example he would watch me and listen to how i talked to the prospective customers after doing this for a while we'd do joint calls where he would initiate the conversation and I'd be available to jump in and add some important information or I get the customer to make a decision. 
He said we'd listen to transcripts and talk it, and then he would be in charge of the whole call. Then he would create his own training videos, freeing me from having to train anyone else on sales again. I could move on. Lesson learned. So that's really powerful. The key to make going from like zero figures to nine figures is leveraging your time, teaching others how to do things so they can teach others. So it's not all one to one. So here's another um, sales copy that he would do. So he says, number one, listen, listen to the customer. Don't just start talking about your thing. Listen to what they're going through, what their needs are, what they want, and then show your thing according to that. So he'd say, when someone walked in, I'd ask what had brought them in here today. And they'd say, well, we've been fighting about how loud the TV is since he can't hear. And so he'd ask them, like, if we could solve that problem, could you, um, let me see what I wrote. Okay, so he would say, if we could solve that problem, would you want to experience what that would be like? And they would say yes. So he said, okay, let's see what we can do. And then he'd show them, you know, the hearing aids and sell it. And it was much easier than explaining all the science behind how hearing aids work. So see, that's the thing. Most people, like when you go to buy a car, like I think Dean Graziosi uses this example. When you, he would say, when I was selling cars back in the day, I wouldn't tell the people exactly how air conditioning works and like all this stuff, like the air goes through here and it gets cooled here and all of that stuff. No, I would just say that if it's hot outside, it'll be cool in your car because I guess AC wasn't that common back then. So just give the benefits of what you're selling, not all the features, people don't care. Like um, whoever came up with Apple, uh, he would, when he first came out with the, um, like to listen to music, I forget what it's called. But instead of saying this holds 14 gigabytes of memory or whatever it was, he would say, you can have 14,000 songs in your pocket because that is language people can understand, right? So that is really important. And then going back to hiring employees, instead of treating them like widgets, ask them, what are your five-year and 10-year personal, professional, and financial targets, PPF targets? And then, what if I could show you how to accelerate it to your five-year target to like one year's, one year? And then, what if I could show you how to accelerate your 10-year target to three years? Would you be willing to go all in no matter the hard spots? So not everyone will want it, but you will attract rock stars that way. And then he looks for engaging and quick thinking people anywhere he goes, you know, for employees, like the grocery stores, anywhere. And he says, engage them in conversations about their careers. And then let them know that your company is looking for extraordinary people. Another point he said was have other people do the work for you so you can guide the strategic growth and direction of the organization. Stay in your zone of geni genius, you know, which is what you're best at and what time flies under, you know, when you're doing it. So stay in your zone of genius. And if you don't know what that is, read The Big, the Big Leap. Read that book. Or I also have another book review on that book. It is so good. It's life changing. Uh, another thing he said was his first marriage failed because they later realized they had different dreams for their life. For him, he had success as his dream, and hers was quiet cottage life with like cows and, you know, dogs running around. So that is what made that fail. So you need to make sure that you both have the same goals in life. So he coaches relationships, and this is what he does. He says, draw three columns on a piece of paper. On each side, like on one side, she puts her interests and focus. And then on the other side, the other column on the other side, he puts his interests and focus. And then in the middle, put what your shared interests and focuses are. And I thought that was really powerful. And then he said, what, when was the last time you asked yourself what you really wanted? What made you a happy person? If money wasn't an, a job, an object, what would you spend your days doing? Do you even know? Like actually sit down and like think about this one. How much time would you want to spend with your family and friends? How would you want to structure your day so you could show up as the best version of yourself? Write these answers down. Create a vision and believe you deserve it. Visualize you flying in your plane, eating in your yacht. You know, imagine what you've accomplished 10 years out. 
So what you imagine you want to accomplish 10 years out, imagine you living that today. Visualize that. And that will make it come real. Because it will train your subconscious to start seeing the opportunities to make that happen. And then he says, when you're under pressure, ask, is this thing pulling me towards or away from my goal? So that's a really good one. Is this thing pulling me towards or away from my goal? And then he says, one of the best ways to discover what you want is by a list of love and hates. So I'm going to read out a list of love to do's and so write them down and answer them. And then a list of hate to do's. So love to do. What do you love to do in your business? What are you passionate about? What gets you out of bed in the morning? What inspires you to go all in? What excites you? What do you want to create? What thing are you best at? And then hate to do's. What disappoints you? What keeps you awake at night? What makes you want to stay in bed in the morning? What makes you procrastinate? What do you wish you didn't have to do? What fills you with regret? And what wastes your time? Now, this is another list of things that I want you guys to sit down and write them out. I copied them out of the book because they're super powerful. Um, definitely do this, okay? So, what type of work do I want to do every day in my business? These questions will help you understand yourself, okay? So do them. What type of work do I want to do every day in my business? What kind of lifestyle do I want to provide my family with? What are my personal goals? What are my professional goals? How much money do I want to make? How big do I want my company to be? How do I measure success? What do I want my employees to say about me? What do I want my legacy to be? What do I want to leave to the world, my family, my friends, and my team? What do I want my customers to say about me? What, what would my family say about my work-life balance? What are my favorite hobbies or pastimes? How do I prefer to volunteer my time? What subjects do I enjoy going deep on with friends? What do I daydream of more than anything else? What have been my favorite job responsibilities? What are my pet peeves? What tasks in my business energize me the most? What tasks in my business do I excel at above all others? What tasks do I think I could excel at but haven't tried? If I could start another company, would I? And what would it be? What kind of people do I love to be with and why? Who do I most admire and why? If I won a hundred million, what would I do with it? If money were no, were absolutely no object at all, I had no practical considerations to take into account and all possibilities were open to me, what would be the first thing I'd do in my business? So those are really powerful, deep questions. And if you take the time to do that, good on you. Um, so another thing he said was, um, his business aspirations were about proving something to others and not what he truly wanted. So that's why he you know, didn't do so well early in life because he was always just trying to do it to prove to others. And there's a point in time where you need to stop caring about others and do it for you and that's when your success will just go through the roof. So find this out for yourself. And then write down your business goals. And especially if you have a business partner, partner you need to write down your goals. Because you can just assume the other person is thinking just like you and you guys want to do the same things. But no, one person might just want to have the business because he's always wanted to. And you might want to be making it a hundred million dollar business. And those are two totally different, you know, ways of going about it, you know. So another thing he said was argue for your limitations and they are yours. So just say to yourself, yes, I can make more money. Yes, I can 10x the money I make. Because if you're going to argue for, no, I can't do it, well, then it's yours, right? Um, next page. Uh, this is the last page we have. So he says he also has a talk with his employees on their first interview that I'll only invest in you and your success if you do the same for me. If not, then it's a no-go. So... I thought that was really powerful because it keeps the employees kind of like on the same page as you, right? So that you're both working on growing. And then, so this is all about like how to hire an employee, right? So beyond positive thinking, a no-nonsense formula for getting the results you want by Robert Anthony 
is a book he has each employee and client read. It teaches them how to think in terms of solutions than problems. So when an employee or client says something they think is wrong in the company, his first question is, what do you think we can do about this? That way people aren't just coming all at you with just all the problems and not using their head. So yeah, it trains your employees to be problem solvers and a, as a help to the company. And it says the best time to start seeing this quality and of self-image is when you're hiring. So here's what to ask to see if their self-confidence so here's what to ask to see their self-confidence and self-esteem levels. So he asks them in the interview, how would you define self-confidence? How self-confident do you believe you are? Tell me about a situation that might demonstrate your confidence to do this job. Walk me through your process for making a tough business decision. What do you think is the definition between confidence and arrogance? And he says, watch the person's body language as they answer. If they have lack of confidence, then hire at your own risk, okay? Because insecure people cause tons of problems. He says, but you need to feel this way about yourself. You need to be, you know, you need to feel worthy and that your business is a privilege of working for. You need to feel that about yourself, working for your business, or why would they? And that's a really good point. So he says, your business should work for you, not the other way around. Bus proof your business. So like if you get hit by a bus tomorrow, would your business still be able to run? That's how you know if your business is bus proof. So he says, you must always be talking about the vision and inspiring your workers to that goal. Show them, remind them what's in it for them, personally, professionally, and financially. And remember that most people are not entrepreneurs. They're not like you. They want to be told what to do, unlike you. You know, you don't like to be told what to do, so then you don't tell others what to do. But the thing is, is others are not you. They're working for you because they're an employee, not an entrepreneur, or at least not yet. So you need to tell them what to do. Don't just assume and expect of them what you haven't told. And he says, this process is what he uses for, so everyone knows what to do and, that, and so skills are passed on. So number one, perfect processes for duplication. Number two, Teach others to duplicate best practices. Number three, lead by nurturing and teaching self-accountability and results-driven activities. And number four, make sure I have a business model that aligns everyone's interests based on targets attained. He says, train others to do tasks instead of saying that, here, let me do it. It'll save time. You know, how many of us do that, right? He says, think instead, what do I offer that makes people want to work for me? You know, this will help you attract employees, good ones. And how do I learn to train others so that they too can have success through my business? Because the key to life is just seeing everything from another person's point of view. Everyone is just interested in their self-interest, their problems, their goals. So you need to step into their world and, and then find a way to make what they want to happen also be aligned with what you want. And that is how you make magic. So he says the key to leading is to persuade others to believe that they are far more capable than they think and to get them to stop dwelling on or reinforcing their limitations. And then he also said that if we divided all the money in the world equally, in a short time the rich would be rich again and the poor would be poor, would be poor again. It's a consciousness, abundance consciousness or poverty consciousness. So you need to <laughs> change your consciousness about money if you don't have like a hundred million dollars and obviously you don't have a consciousness that can have that right now. So you have to expand that container and we do that by changing, you know, our identity, our beliefs about money. Because if you have a negative belief about money that any money you have is taken from somebody else and the super scarcity mindset, then you'll not want to have money and anything, and you'll just subconsciously, subconsciously get rid of it. Right? So here's some positive affirmations you might try. Say these over and over and over again so until you actually believe them, okay? And it'll change the way you think about money and you'll be able to attract money and yeah, even get to seven figures. So he says, these are my affirmations. I choose to build a hundred million dollars in net worth. I choose to be the best father and husband or I choose to be the best wife and mother. I choose to be the best business partner. I choose to know how to be rich. 
I choose to teach my clients and others how to be wealthy. I choose to deserve material wealth. I choose to know how to achieve my goals. I choose to allow my income to exceed my outflow. I choose to give myself permission to enjoy money and embrace life. I choose to embrace a life of success and wealth. I choose to be rich in consciousness. I choose for my business to have a surplus of cash. I choose for my business to have cash to invest. I choose to help my mentors amplify their messages. I choose to believe that the universe holds unlimited abundance. I choose to be an example of abundance by creating wealth. I choose to pay my employees well and to create the best place for people to succeed. I choose to be the dominant player in my business space. I choose to profit share and use above market incentives to surround myself with the best staff. I choose to teach my team how to become wealthy. I choose to offer so much value for my customers that they always want to work with me. I choose to help my clients to build the highest value businesses in their marketplaces. I choose to help my clients become wealthy. I choose to offer the best value with the highest returns for my customers. I choose to offer so much value to my customers that price is never an issue. I choose to be honest, transparent, and innovative. I choose to support causes that are important to me and my family. So those are really good ones. And then he said, um, let me see, where's my... So another point he made was, whenever you give and don't see an immediate return, think of it as you're putting it in the universal bank. It will come back to you with interest at just the right time. Be as confident of this as the sun rising daily. And then he said, release everything you no longer want to create in life and give away things, you know, make room. And giving must be balanced with receiving. You know, they offer to pay, say thank you. And when you don't receive, you slight them and block the flow of money. And for employers, you know, have on Monday, on Monday 15 minutes where they share a win, personal or professional, and or financial. You know, this builds rapport. And monthly PPF meetings to help employees with their goals and the companies. You know, this helps keep everyone on, this, on the same track. And then he said, the last thing I'll leave you with is create for tomorrow, live for today. Create for tomorrow, but live for today. And that's a really powerful one. So definitely, you know, drop down your thoughts below and definitely like, share, and subscribe if you want to hear more about, you know, more book reviews because I love reading. And these are super good. They help us grow so much just by reading other people's experiences and their wisdom. So I'll see you in the next one. Bye.